It's Monday, January 11th, 2016. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights tonight. Nuclear vessels. Not to get into the details, because that's more of a meta moment thing, but we got a lot of conventions coming up, I realize. One convention per month for January, February, March, April. Yeah, so. and I've got more. Pack South. Yep. Magfest. Magfest. Then... Pack- We've got ZenkaiCon, PAX East, Anime Boston. Oh, I forgot about ZenkaiCon. Yeah. Uh, maybe five conventions. Well, you moment? said you might skip at ZenkaiCon, so I tactically. I've skipped a lot of ZenkaiCons. So why not skip some more? I did tactically put in panels that I could do on my own. Mm-hmm. Because I'm, and also I'm only going Saturday and Sunday. I'm not going Friday. Mm. I'm, I'm probably gonna head out like Friday night, like after work in the Amtrak, because. Uh, Bolt buses don't go to Lancaster. (laughs) No one goes to Lancaster. (laughs) And there is an Amtrak station actually near the convention center. Yeah, it's just down the street. It's a straight straight shot. So I could could live with that. I could live with that. As long as it's not too cold. So I bitch a lot on the show about how there's no phone for me. And, you know, I want to buy the the Sony Xperia Z5 Compact is probably the best cell phone hardware in the world, if you want to run Android, it's waterproof. Like everything about. But does the it run the newest Android without any bullshit? Uh, six Also, it's Sony. Uh, yeah, it's six That's troubling. With, with some Sony bullshit in it, right? Which I mean, isn't a lot. You don't trust Lenovo. You're gonna trust Sony, who was the first to put like you know evil spyware DRM on a on an audio CD. You know what? I do <laughs> trust Sony more than I trust Lenovo. No, oh, I bet barely. Sony's malware is at least well constructed. Sony actually, Sony actually has like the best cameras right now. Yeah, that's the problem. Sony <laughs> has really good hard. If if Sony could be split into a hardware company <laughs> and a bullshit company, I feel like Sony do real well. Yeah, just sell your hardware with no software on it whatsoever. People will take the Sony A7S camera and it'll just run Android instead of whatever the yeah. hell garbage it runs now. But you don't understand how good that Z5 Compact is as a phone. Like it's how amazing. good could it be? It's also tiny. It'd be better than the iPhone five. I mean, uh, I'd say. Well, the thing is, like, it's hard to compare. Uh, apples to Androids <laughs> because the OS, like the experience is so different. So mm-hmm. in terms of hardware though, I think it's better than the iPhone 5. Better than the iPod mini? The iPod nano? Uh, that might actually be too small for a phone right now. Why? Unless I could have a separate screen like on my wrist, like a big screen. What's the problem? Uh, that I, I could not play Nurishima Hacks on a like 40 by 40 screen. That's fine. <laughs> anyway, and there's a rumor that's pretty substantiated that there's going to be another, there's going to be a third pillar of the iPhone land. There's going to be the iPhone C class devices. Well, they already have that. They had the iPhone 5C. And then they got rid of it. Uh, and, I think you can, can you still get it? Uh, it's not, they're not making them anymore. And mm, it, was the widely, Apple store. it was widely considered to be a failure. Oh, uh, we have a lot of them at work, and a lot of my coworkers bought them and loved them. Oh, yeah. So Some that's of them what's still in, use them. It's widely considered to be a failure, but apparently they have a deep fandom among people who wanted a smaller phone. Yeah, so right now the iPhones you can get that are currently in production are the 6, 6S, and. 5S, which is just an iPhone 5, pretty yep. much, uh, which is slightly better, I guess. So the the iPhone 6C, or it might be a 7C, we're not sure. Whoops. This is the year of iPhone 7, so in September they're going to announce the iPhone 7. I'll get it. Probably. So the rumor is Unless <laughs> April or May they might announce the 6C. That's a big deal, and it makes this rumor less credible because uh, yeah, the except- iPhones have been on a September schedule for years. Yes, and the rumor is that the C devices are going to be on their own separate schedule, and partly because of lackluster iPhone sales from the previous year. They did decrease orders on iPhones to you know the manufacturers in China recently, because basically we're at a point where everyone's just fucking got a phone, and the phones are lasting longer. And if you've got like an iPhone 6S, a lot of people have no reason to get the 7 when it comes out. Right, it's like, well, I mean, if you have an iPhone 5, like you're still fucking good today. Yeah, an iPhone 5S I- is iPhone a great phone. iPhone 4 is even good today, so it's okay. people are good with phones for now, like they're not buying iPhone 6s well, and 6s at the rate that they expected. So, like, they got workers who are just like at home, not working over in China, not making iPhones because Apple's like, we don't need any more. Only order this many. And Android's the same way. I mean, I'm using a, a Nexus 5, and you know what? There is no better Android phone. Like, sure, you could get a 5x. But there is nothing better in the 5X as far as any user of a phone except Conrad would care about. Mm-hmm. So the rumor is that they're going to release this uh, iPhone 6-ish hardware in a size. The rumor ranges from iPod Touch 
That's or the iPhone perfect. Touch. We have an iPod Touch at work, the newest one. Yeah. It is incredible. Yeah. It is so good. So the size, the shape, the thin everything about it is a mir- is a miracle. There's a credible rumor that it's gonna be that size, give so, or take a millimeter. I'll pay for that. I'll pay, m- biggest, I'll pay more for the smaller one. So the biggest that it would be appears to be an iPhone 4. That's iPhone 4 was the perfect size. iPhone 5 had a better screen. It was a better device. Yep. But compared to the iPhone 4, it was thinner, which was good. The thinness is better, but it was it was too long. I mean, look at this compared compar- to I got a screen iPhone up here, 4. Scott. Look at that comparison. That's the phone right. we might Compar- get. The iPhone 5 was too long. The iPhone, you know, it was like, I want the iPhone 5, but just not as long as the iPhone 5. I'm going to do iPhone 4 height, but with all the stuff that was in the iPhone 5, only probably faster nowadays. But yeah. That's They're what also- I want. Uh, it looks like they're going to ditch the plastic because they made them kind of like colorful plastic. I like the colorful the plastic. They're going to have the same metal as every other iPhone. I want which, colors, though. Yeah, well, they'll have the, Green. the metal colors. Green me. They probably won't have rose gold. They'll probably keep that. They're I like don't want to want the bullshit special. rose gold. I always get the boring gray one, but that's because there's no green. Yeah. If there was a, if there was like a metal green. Green oh, me yeah. up. Uh, Scott, the Xperias have a green option. Big deal. I said it doesn't help, with the, but everything behind the green is garbage. thing is, the only reason I didn't get a Z5C now because you can get a gray market one in the U.S. even though it's not released in the U.S. and confirmed Android 6. The only reason I didn't get one is that because it's the international edition, it's missing two or three LTE channels, which wouldn't matter that much except most of the new coverage that T-Mobile and other people are putting out is in those bands in the U.S. Well, you can't be using T-Mobile now that the CEO is like, EFF, who the fuck is that? Yeah, so we'll see what I do with phones. But uh, you can read these rumors. The iPhone 6E will probably come out ahead of the iPhone 7 to get a sales bump because then they expect that a bunch of people will buy that who otherwise wouldn't have upgraded during the 7 cycle because there's a bigger demand for a small well, phone than people realize. I can't do anything until the iPhone 7 comes out in September, October, right? The rumor is then- also that it's going to be cheaper, like a lot cheaper, but not cheap. Well, that doesn't matter. They're and talking I'll like, see what's available. They're talking like 400-ish bucks. That's a good deal. Which is still like double. Especially I, now since the subsidies and contracts are all gone now in yeah. the U.S. Goodbye. Uh, I mean... But I think that's also what's hurting new iPhone sales is that, is that, is people need to buy iPhones now. And they're like, oh, $800? Fuck that. Yeah. I think what also is hurting that, honestly, the hardware on phones is good enough for 99.9% of what anyone does with them. The only limiting factor that anyone gives a shit about is either the size or the battery life. Yep. Uh, except for old people. A lot of I my don't know why people have such problems with battery life. Fucking charge your phone. I'm the, I've never had my phone die out. I've had to come close at conventions, but I always make it to the hotel room with like 5%. And I'm yeah. like, all right. And then I plug it in and go to bed. I wake up, it's 100. Or if I'm really like not sure I'm going to make it, I do have in my bag that tiny battery. Yeah, I only have to use that at conventions where I wake up way early and get back to the room at like 2 a.m. So yeah, that's Mag how Fest. long, that's how Fest, long my phone shit. battery lasts. How could you possibly run out your battery? What the hell are you doing? Because they're watching movies on it. Are like you all watching the time. Netflix literally like all day while you're at this? Con- Apparently. <laughs> you have to watch a lot of Netflix to kill that battery. <laughs> so uh, as much as I would like to stay on Android, there is literally no Android phone to buy. At all. Like, they're all garbage. They're all giant pieces well, of garbage. I hope you didn't spend a lot of money on Android apps. Because I spent a lot of money on an iPhone app, so I can't leave. I've spent about <laughs> or 40. I'll lose all that. I've spent about 40 bucks on Android apps, so I'll probably lose about 40 bucks worth. But I spent a lot more than that. As much as I know I'm going to bitch about Android or uh, iPhone's OS and interface for a while just because it'll be different. There's nothing to bitch about. Uh, yeah, fine. but I'm used to Android and I like Android. Mm, I don't but like it. It's the awful. Android ship sailed. There aren't any good Android phones, so if a small iPhone comes out, like, I'll just jump ship without even looking back. I'll put up with, even if I hate... The main complaint people have with iPhone They is, can't get rid of some of those icons. All right, so you just hide them in a folder. Big fucking deal, right? And then the other thing people complain about is, like, how do you do this, right? A lot of my coworkers are like, how do you do this? I just want to... I just don't have files. And it's like, well, Dude, you- my coworker today! Oh, he, he, like, got, he uses... He has an Android phone. He's like... How do I get to the file explorer on my phone? I was like, plug it into your computer. And he was like, no, but I want it on the phone. And I was like, there why? Isn't one. Yeah, why? It's like, you just have to accept the fact that you're going to do the same thing. You can still do everything that you do by with your file explorer, finder, or whatever. You just got to do it differently, right? For example, I got a movie and I want to watch it on my phone, right? So you could use iTunes. People hate iTunes for no reason that I understand. It always works for me. 
but everything works for me apparently. I don't but like iTunes, but then again, I have no use for iTunes. Right, but another thing you can do is if you get the VLC app for your iPhone or iPad, you can then access your video files in like 20 different ways. Uh, Scott, I realize that most people, like even relatively young people, Never heard of VLC. Okay, you can get the Amazon... I mean, look at all of our unnamed friends at AnimeCons who use, like, Ghetto Virus Player. Right, and maybe it's maybe it's music you want to get onto there with your drag and drop. Well, just drag all your music into Amazon Music Player into the cloud, and then install the Amazon Music app, and, oh, look, there's all your music. Same with the Amazon Kindle app, which is free also. You can just drag PDFs and shit onto the internet in the cloud from your computer, and then open up the app on your phone, and there they are, right? So you don't need any file explorer nonsense. So anyway, I'm probably going to jump ship. If this comes out, like I'm just going to pre-order day one like immediately and never look back. Oh, because you're like, that's right, because you're not on this two-year cycle that I'm on. You're well, just like, whenever there's a phone, you can do whatever. Well, because I, I'm at the end of my cycle. I'm at the point of I would upgrade my Android phone. My, my, and there is literally no phone in the world <laughs> that is better enough than I made the Nexus such 5. I made such a good move buying that iPhone 3G on day one. Waited in line for like a half hour also. Yeah. Yeah. So I think Scott has some uh, Apple iPhone news, too. So well, this is news. We've discussed this before because this is not the first time for this rumor. But the rumor is coming back so hard and strong this time that I feel like, you know, it definitely has all the hallmarks of being even more true than the rumor you just had. Yeah. Which yeah. is that they're really going to get rid of the headphone port on that iPhone and perhaps other iDevices. I would be moderately annoyed because... The TRS. The TRS. And then they're just going to make you either A, use Bluetooth headphones, or B... Uh, which a lot of people already do. Yeah. Right. Or B, plug headphones that go into the lightning cable or get an adapter that goes from lightning to headphones. So in my experience, most Bluetooth headphones, the sound quality is good, but it's actually noticeably not as good as my like Shure or Edemotic uh, TRS just regular mm. headphones. I had Bluetooth headphones at work. I still have them. They were really good. The problem is they were cheap and the little head thing snapped and they won't stay on my ears that yep. <laughs> and I couldn't fix it. <laughs> Uh, uh, actually, so interestingly, for the 5C, or the 6C, not the 5C, 6C, 7C, the uh, rumors specifically show that they still have TRS. Okay. Because they're not thin. All right, yeah. The, the reason they're getting rid of it is because it's like it's the thickest thing in there. So yep, if they get but rid with of the that, 5C, or that and the ca- 5C. That, the headphone jack and the camera are pretty much the only things keeping them from making the phone like a lot smaller. But they can't make the phone that thin if they also make it small in the other dimensions. So the 6C has to be fatter. So there's no benefit to getting rid of TRS. Right. This though. is why lightning is such a tiny, thin connector, right? It's, yeah. Anyway. But yeah, I mean, the thing is, Lightning, as far as I know, and I could be wrong, the old dock connector, you know, the big wide one that was on iPods yep. that they used for like the early iPhones, the 3G and whatnot, that dock connector had a ton of pins on it. And some of those pins had analog audio output. So you could actually get a really simple connector that would go into the dock connector and then headphones or cassette tape that's in your car or, you know, all kinds of stuff. And I had this, right? It was, it was really simple because like, the, you know, it had in there somewhere. Some of those pins are for charging. Some of them were for firewire. Well, I remember I had a device that I basically plugged because I, I had my iPod Nano mm-hmm. and it had a TRS in the bottom. Yep. And I plugged a device into that that rebroadcasted my audio over local FM. So yeah, I, I had one of those it. too. But anyway, the lightning connector, as far as I know, is 100% digital. Which means if you want to get a headphone adapter that goes into the lightning hole, that, that has to have a digital to analog converter. Right, so the thing that you're gonna shove into the bottom of your iPhone to then put your headphones into is probably gonna cost a lot of money. If I know Apple, thirty bucks or fifty bucks. Yep, which we right. talked about this on the episode. I'm not gonna get into like why TRS. They already is a have a connector standard. that goes from that to HDMI, and I have that connector, and it's like fifty bucks. Yep, I suspect. There's going to be a lot of people complaining about this on the internet and freaking out, but the reality is, no one's gonna actually care. Nope. Who ha- who uses iPhones? Nope. No one's gonna not buy the next iPhone because of this. Uh, and I think a someone lot, someone is. Uh, you know that really obstinate person. I don't know if that person yeah, that person has never actually owned an iPhone. <laughs> that person is running GNU Linux in their basement on their desktop. They're, no, they got Amiga. <laughs> Mm. I just, you know, the what the only it's not it's fine if we get rid of this old connector right it's not the you know we can we have Bluetooth is fine it's also an open standard right Lightning is sort of openish right even though no one else uses it but Apple but the problem is if you go to the store and suddenly this you know you could buy any headphone in the store right now it would really suck if you went to the store and it's like 
No, you got to buy the right headphone. You can't just buy any headphone. You got to buy the right one. And you bought the wrong ones. They don't work. You know, we need to make sure that every device on the whole earth, you know, from this point forward, yep. uses the same thing, right? Which will be fine because everything is going to be u- the USB right. C 3.1 it's connector. Not, it's not, we've done this plenty of times, right? USB, then newer USB. Then, Except, right? you know, there's going to be people. We switch from, you know, from there's compo- going to be people who have Thunderbolt RCA on to one side. to HDMI. We didn't have a problem. Uh, a lot of people had problems along the way and we just let them perish. Yeah. It's not really the biggest deal. Dude, I the remember. Other pro- as the other thing is we can't, once we pick something, Right, we can't be changing it we, as frequently as we change USB. We got to be changing it like once in a blue moon because you don't want to be buying headphones and then suddenly I buy some lightning headphones and then five years from now Apple's like, yeah, no more lightning. It's like fuck you. Well, I remember I had you know my old iPod was like you iPods used to use FireWire mm-hmm. and then I had a FireWire port and I would use it and then I got a new iPod and it just didn't work with FireWire anymore. Yeah, that USB only. Yeah. Uh, so I have an anecdote that's relevant to that in terms of people misunderstanding those things. Mm -hmm. After we had our freshman year in college at RIT, so this is like 2001, we all went back home and I was back at home, you know, in Michigan, hanging out and a lot of my high school friends were around and I went to a party and they wanted to watch a movie. And then they say, oh, Rim, uh, you should help us set up the home stereo theater or whatever. Oh, that's good. They actually ask the person who knows best because a lot of times I go somewhere and it's like, I see the TV. It's clearly not in HD, even though it's an HD TV. I yep. can see that they're not using HDMI and it has nothing to do with me. But they're like... And no one wants to hear my advice. You're going to computer school, so you know how to do this. You do know how to do it. So yeah, so I go back <laughs> behind their TV and what I see is RCA cables plugged into component. All right. On the DVD player. Right. And plugged into the RCA inputs on the TV. So that wasn't working. <laughs> Clearly. But there was also an S video cable plugged into the DVD player, and that was plugged into the TV. And their complaint was that the HD whatever has always worked fine, but the sound never works unless S video is video working. only. So S yeah. video is video only. So the fact that you could plug the same cable into an RC, you know, RCA connectors were used for both component and the old RCA analog stuff. People just plug cables randomly into all the well, things that's, they fit into. That's a mistake of the design of component cables, actually, was that they were the same, you know, big stick in the middle, ring around the edge cables. Yeah, I feel like they should have made them a slightly different size. Right? So you, couldn't HG, plug it in. you know, modern cable design, they make sure that, you know, cables can only go in the right way. You know, you can't possibly put them into something that's not where they belong. Yeah, you can't. And if they're directional, they make them a shape so that they only go in in the right direction. You kids, in the early days of building computers, like, you plug a cable in the wrong way, everything's fried forever. Yeah, now if you open up your computer, it's not possible to put something in the wrong spot. It just won't fit. Yep. I mean, you you plug a hard drive into the wrong half of a parallel cable, and it just wouldn't work, and you wouldn't know why. Like, I used to get IDE ribbon cables that didn't have that little notch in the middle. Ooh. And you'd have to know, looking at the red stripe on the ribbon, which direction it went in on the motherboard. The red stripe had to be closest to the power on the drive. I would look at the motherboard instruction manual to see the numbers on the pinout so I would put it towards the zero yeah. end. And I, but the worst was and when, when now when you have an SATA cable. You can't fuck it up unless when, you can't even... If you can fu- if you fuck up an SATA cable putting it the wrong place or the wrong whatever, you can't even build a Lego set. You're so dumb, right? So, <laughs> like a baby Lego, like Duplo. So I got one last little news here and this is kind of fun. I'm going to read the anecdote from Slashdot because it's just kind of funny. Okay. Uh, an anonymous reader reader writes, NVIDIA GPUs don't clear out memory that was previously allocated, and neither does Chrome. Uh, when a user recently fired up Diablo 3 several hours after closing an incognito mode window that contained pornography, mm-hmm. the game launched with snapshots of that last private browsing session appearing on the screen. So what I'm going to actually link to instead of the slash dot, I like how they're very open. They're like, yeah, I was looking at porn. And then I saw my porn in Diablo when I launched it. Oh, well, this is really interesting. So what happens is when your computer is drawing to the screen, right? There's a space in the in the video memory called the frame buffer. And what it's yep. doing is drawing literally your screen. So let's say your screen is 800 by 600, which is a really old computer. So you've got basically like an array. So, and each <laughs> pixel on the screen is 32-bit color or well, 24-bit color. So you have 24 bits times 800 times 600, that many bits in a, in a space. And the computer has to draw the screen. So what it does is it arranges those bits. It says, aha, the top left pixel is 
pure green. So in those, you know, 24 bits, it puts 00, zero FF00, zero zero, all right? And there's your bits. And then it says, well, what's the next pixel? And it does this ridiculously fast. It does this so fast that it can draw all the pixels on the screen at 75 frames a second, usually, or 60, or whatever your frame rate is, right? Yep. So there's a space in the memory where it fills up, it writes down in memory what color every pixel is, and then the video you know, hardware sends, turns that space in memory into a signal that it sends to your monitor, and the monitor takes that and draws the pixels on the screen, and it keeps doing this over and over again. Usually you'll do like double buffering or triple, where you'll have like multiple buffers, and it'll be drawing multiple screens at once, or it'll be just draw a screen, and while that one's being displayed, it starts drawing the next screen, and then once it finishes drawing that screen and it starts being displayed, it starts using the previous memory space and over and over. Yep. Anyway. Now, it's a good security practice applications or operating systems should theoretically wipe out or make inaccessible memory that has been released by right. an application. So theoretically, if you could access someone's frame buffers or if it, the computer is storing up old frames and not using the same SX space and memory, you could see what the person did on that computer going into the past, regardless of what they were doing. If you can access the video card's memory, you can access basically screenshots so going this guy, back so however porn guy, far. Porn guy, he was like, huh, I wonder if I can just get shit out of the frame buffer. This is a big security hole. Let me play around. Uh, in the intro, I'm quoting him now. Right, so guy. here's the thing is that the Chrome and most modern browsers... Chrome you, does not clear memory from they're incognito using, sessions. They're using the GPU to render right your browser you know, image, right? So And your computer is generally using the GPU to render everything these days, even yep. 2D stuff. So now the GPU is storing up all these things, right, With you know, in its, in its video RAM. So this guy wrote an application, and you, just across users, just on the PC, period, no security at all, that would scan GPU memory, because you can just read it all, apparently. Yeah, you or, can, I mean, you can write a program in C that just tell, sends commands to the GPU, and it'll do So we wrote a program to. that just looked for non-zero pixels, mm -hmm. grabbed everything it could get, and then did some algorithms to rearrange because it would get like, you know, corners and parts of images. Yep. And he recreated all these Reddit pages he'd been reading previously, pixel perfect. And yeah, you can just totally spy on people many hours after they looked at their porn just by scanning the So the, the frame real buffer. question is there's a bug in Diablo. Why did Diablo upon it needs to render some Oh Diablo like crashed, he said. It was just like Diablo freakishly crashed. Which you know video games. Oh, that okay. So it wasn't it wasn't like a bug in Diablo. No, he spawned okay. he started Diablo. Because that'd be weird if it you showed normally, him all his porn and then it crashed. Normally when a video game loads, you know it says loading for a long time. Yep. Usually what it's doing is copying all of its textures from this the hard drive into the video memory. And then when it starts rendering, that allows the video card to quickly apply those textures to all the surfaces and whatever it is it needs to yep. render. So it shows so you can replace and then it crash. Right. So if his, I guess he goes to joinme.com. Right. So if a picture, you know, if his porn site was in that space in memory, it would get applied to something as if it was a texture and be rendered. Oh my God. He didn't, he censored out the image, but he didn't censor out. So he was looking at redhead teen Mary McRae fingered in the hallway. All right. Awesome. That sounds hot. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, I guess if you look at things, whatever they might be, in your incognito windows, and you share that computer with people, or anyone has malware, because you know malware has probably been doing this for years. Uh, no, it probably hasn't, but I think it might start now, because someone who writes malware will see this. Yeah, at the same time, if I was going to write malware and I was trying to steal passwords... Other You're not going to steal passwords from screenshots because you can't see them. Yeah, but you could probably steal credit card numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway. But anyway, things of the day. This blog, I follow it because it's just about like war and peacekeeping and just sort of an interesting look at that world from a hobbyist perspective. <laughs> a a good, hobbyist of war. Yeah, it, it's, it's like if you are if you know about war and war nerds and stuff, it's just a cool blog. But uh -huh. basically, and it's kind of relevant to what it's we're talking about. It's not a good about, kind of nerd to be. We did an episode in 2007, Scott, that we just called Weapons. We and needed ideas. We still need ideas. 2007, running out send, of ideas. Send them in. And this is an article about a gentleman who basically worked for the... He had a, he had a gun shop in Manhattan... But it didn't sell guns. When you can still have a gun shop in I know. Manhattan. It didn't sell guns. It sold custom holsters for concealed guns to hide them. 
I guess that's like all the bong shops we have. You can't sell weed, but you can sell bongs. But <laughs> actually, that was a front for the CIA and the FBI. And in the back of the office, he just fucking made crazy one-off custom guns for spies. I'm sure you could tell by going to a shop like that. I mean, the stuff, the place that sells bongs, you could get weed there. Yeah, right? <laughs> everybody know, knows. I actually don't know the if the place you can. that sells gun holsters. You can get guns there. I don't know if I could get weed at the place downstairs because you see, you know that bodega by us. They, the the whole front of the building is nothing but bongs. I'm sure you can get weed there. I don't know if I walk in there and like, hey. You can at least get weirdo tobacco to put in a hookah or whatever. Yeah, but I don't know if I went to them and I was like, hey, can I buy weed from you? If they'd be like, yes, how many weeds would you well, like? Well, you, they might discriminate against you being a white dude thinking you're a cop, right? That'd yeah. be great. That might like, be the look, only reason they say no. Yeah, yep. but I'm also kind of a nerd hipster dude, so maybe that, I mean, no cop looks like me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, they talk about... Because a lot of this got declassified now, the kinds of crazy weapons this dude made, because all this stuff was very recently declassified, and a lot of what he did apparently is still classified. But I think my favorite one, and they made a lot of these, is a 12-shot clipboard. <laughs> so, specifically for someone who's negotiating with a terrorist hostage taker to sit down with them to go over their demands and then kill everyone in the room. <laughs> I guess except the hostages. Okay. I learned about, uh, so check this out. This is a site. You know, guns have different kinds of sites. Apparently spies were like, we generally don't shoot people far away. We need pistols that are good for, like, killing people in the room with us. Like, pretty close range. So they have this custom kind of sight that's designed for, like, quick hip shots. Like, whip a gun out and shoot someone like gangsters do in old movies. Mm -hmm. And the whole gun is covered in Teflon so you can draw it quickly. And Without dro it drop snagging. it, drop <laughs> it quickly. Yeah, it won't snag on anything. It'll just fall on the ground because you can't hold on to it. You might as well cover it in grease, woman. <laughs> Have you got any grease? Yes, then yes, grease we do. Me up. Okay, okay. So I kickstarted something a while ago because it was nine dollars. It was one of those tiny computers. Now we got plenty of tiny computers. We got the Arduinos of the world. There's a Microsoft one. There's a Texas Instruments one. Right? There's the Raspberry Pi, which is mad popular these days. It's the kind of things that I, the only reason I don't kickstart all these things is that I never have a good reason to use them. I don't have a good reason to use it either, but this one was nine bucks. So I'm like, whatever. Who gives a shit? Right? Nine bucks. I'll get a tiny computer. I don't care. You know, it might be useful. It's really tiny. It's only nine dollars. I won't miss the nine dollars if this computer sits in my, you know, with my Arduinos and whatnot. No biggie. Whatever. And I forgot about it because, you know, I kick, sometimes you kickstart something, you just don't forget, remember it. And then one day it shows up. So I opened it, and this is the chip computer, c.h.i.p. And I checked it out because I had it now for nine bucks. And then I realized what the hell it was. And oh my God, let me tell you a story. So I used to work in college at this place, and I was programming for, you know, this board. It was a single board computer with an Intel X scale CPU. And it had like 16 megabytes of storage or something. Like, it was really, really weak. It was kind of big because you had a lot of serial ports and input outputs and things like that. But it was really, really weak and tiny and didn't yeah. have much storage at all. And I had to program for this thing. And one of them cost like 500 bucks. This thing cost $9. It's really tiny. The bottom of it has a plastic thing so you can just rest it on your desk, no problem. It gets power from micro USB. It has one actual USB port for plugging in a mouse, keyboard, whatevs. It has a TRS connector, but the TR is audio, but then the second R is video, so you can plug it into the RCA on a TV or whatever to, to see what, you know, the display. Uh, it has a whole bunch of pins on the top, just like an Arduino does for, you know, controlling electronic devices or an LED readout or analog inputs and all that kind of stuff, power, you know. Uh, but the specs on this thing... For $9, for this ridiculously tiny computer, the CPU is a 1 gigahertz CPU, which is gets that can get stuff done as long as it's not games. Yeah, I mean, my CPU is only 2.6-ish. 512 megabytes of RAM, a 4 gigabyte SSD just like built into this little board. Yeah. And it has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. The Wi-Fi is GN. The Bluetooth is 4.0. You can use it, and it runs Debian. It already runs Debian as soon as you get it. That's ridiculous. You can do, like, more than the Raspberry Pi. Like, Raspberry Pi is junk now, basically, because yeah. this exists. You know what I would use those for? 
if I had my druthers at if I like a Think about this. You could get, let's see, a gig of RAM, $18. So $20 per gigabyte of RAM. Yeah. <laughs> right? This thing is ridiculous. Uh, I mean, you could basically take a monitor and strap this to the back and boom, you're done. Yeah, I would say, you know, conventions like Kineticon or whatever, if we could get a bunch of TVs to stick like bi panel ops, just stick one of those things on the TV. Dude, this thing can run pretty much any emulator, NES, SNES, right? Yeah. It can you can run like all sorts of Linux. You can run Chrome on here. You could run Audacity on here. You could run um you know, the GIMP, emails, VLC. Pretty much anything that runs on Linux will run on this thing. And you can I'm, run a surprising number of games in that, actually. Yeah, I mean, you, if you want it to be super portable, you need to find a battery for it. So, you know, be, How much power does it draw? I mean, I could probably power for a while. Remember if, that? I mean, if you get a giant battery that has micro USB output, which every battery does. Yeah, because I've got that like 26,000 whatever milliamp hour battery. Like, you're freaking good to go. Like, this thing is redonk. Uh, if you have any sort of project that needs any sort of, you know, CPU off to the side, uh, I think Arduino and also Raspberry Pi pretty much have to eat it because the chip is here. In the meta moment, the book club book was a long time ago, The Wheel of Time. I bring this up because I'm moving on to book eight. And Whoa. what I can say is that my favorite thing about The Wheel of Time, are you know the ale? Like those guys? Yes. Met them. Uh, so there's a bunch of ale wannabe weeaboos that come up later. So they're people who aren't ale. People in like tier in all these places. They live like, in- Whoa. Like the young nobles, those ale are super cool. They just so, want to be like them. So they, they start, start acting like them, wear, like taking each start, other guy shan or they whatever. They start wearing ail clothes. Yeah, and half the ale Cooking are like ail food. Half of the ale are like, wow, we these we gotta t- spread the word of how to act like civilized human beings because they're finally getting it. And the other half are like, what the fuck are these kids doing? Can we just kill them? Seriously, guys? Dat cultural can appropriation. I just, can I just go kill them? There's a scene where one dude, Ruark's like, uh, Ran, can I just go murder all those kids because they're really not offensive, just personally annoying to me. <laughs> <laughs> Dat appropriation. We are going to be at PAX South. Our schedule is slightly updated. Uh, as a favor, we let them move Atari game design to the earlier slot because someone needed that panel slot because they have to video a PAX like Penny Arcade panel. And we don't really give a crap. Yeah. <laughs> so they email me. They're like, yeah, uh, you guys have done like every, like a billion fax panels. Are you okay with this? Like, I don't care. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> maybe if they'd put it at like 8 a.m. on Friday, I'd be like, no. Nah, but uh, I don't care. Do so whatever you want. Atari Game Design, Saturday at 11.30 a.m. Scared Yet, a discussion of horror and games. Saturday at 5.30 p.m. Uh, Sunday, January 31st at 1 p.m., Designing Game Rules. All right. Also, PAX is now having a Netrunner tournament, PAX South. Oh, I think yeah. it's Sunday morning at 11, so I can play a little bit and then go do a panel. Yeah. And then I got to fly immediately to Boston from San Antonio that has no direct flights anywhere, as far as I can tell. No one wants to fly directly to San Antonio. No one wants to fly directly to New York from San Antonio. Like, no one except us. That is that is really interesting. Yeah. Like, I expected to not get a direct flight to Boston from somewhere like San Antonio, but can't even get one from New York. Like, really? You should be able to get a flight from New York to anywhere on planet Earth that has an airport directly, right? Yeah, you At least, so. I mean, there might be those flights that are like once a week. You know, if you want to go to a certain country, there's not a flight every day. You yeah, know. you Scott, when I flew to Turkey, there's multiple flights every day to Istanbul. Seven no, but I'm days saying, like, if you want to fly to, say, Luxembourg direct, is there really a flight every day? I think there's at least one every day. There might be one a day, right? It's not like you could go at the time you want. You know? Yeah, let me put it this way New York spoils you so bad on flights. And if you that want, if you want to go to. fly from London to somewhere else, even London, it's like, oh. There's only, like, one flight to Paris left today, so I guess you're fine. If you want to go to Buenos Aires, is there really a flight every day? Maybe one a day at most. Maybe one every other, you know. Yeah. It's like, how many people are going to Argentina from, right, New York every, <laughs> every day? But uh, PAX East uh, coming up. We put our panels in for that, so stay tuned. Uh, uh, what else we got? Anime Magfest. Boston. We put in our panels. MAGFest is coming uh, before any of those. MAGFest. We we got like seven fucking panels. It's gonna be awesome. But uh, also, Magfest is four days long. Dun dun. Oh my god! And it's too early to even book our travel for that. But we'll be right. there. Uh, also, the Patreon edging toward that first stretch goal. Surprisingly, mm. so if we get not that many more patrons, if even a quarter of the people listening to these words right now gave us just one dollar, 
Just one dollar. You don't even have to commit to giving it to us forever. Just Most give it to us for everyone one listening. Month. Probably did give you one dollar. The people who you think are listening just downloaded without listening because no. they have an automatic podcast downloader. We only have like fifty something patrons, but they're giving us like two hundred and fifty bucks a month. What the hell is wrong with you people? Stop giving him money. If all of you just gave us a dollar, do not pay. It'd be better for you. No, and do us. not. Zero dollars you should give. But guys, you can hack Patreon. If you you can- almost de- vast majority of people listening to this have less money than me or Rim. For now. Do not give us money <laughs> unless you have more money than both of us, in which case give us money until we are even with you. Well, guys, there <laughs> is a stretch goal. If you can muster up 24 grand a month, we will, and we're not lying, quit our jobs and do this full time. Uh, well, I'll do whatever you want me to do, yeah. em- new employer person. I'll also eat my hat and probably pass out. <laughs> <laughs> do not. Also, if you are going to throw money away on... The Powerball lottery. Give it to us instead. Yes. Do not th- that's take that Powerball dollar. You're taking dollar. money and you're setting it on fire. If you give it to Rim, you're not setting it on fire. You're only putting it in the toilet, which is less bad than setting it on fire. But also, uh, we you could give a dollar and then we'd hit the stretch goal. So we'd have to release all the episodes. You could just take the not give any more dollars. Just cancel it after the first month. Because the stretch goal is just the peak, the high water mark. So if you guys want to, so if hack, it hits the goal for like one second and then goes under, then well, at least for one month. If it hits it for one month, then I'm obligated. I got to re-release. Oh, so the money has to come in. Yeah, once. Uh, I see. Once. So and if only someone once. just changes their their you know their giving to like a thousand, and then immediately five minutes later brings it down to zero. No, I'm not gonna do it. They actually, you actually have to get the cash. Yeah. Okay. But if we get the cash even once. Then we, which means me, give God your money to a to real charity it. instead. Some suggestions. From Neil Cicerenga's Patreon. You should give the money to. Yeah, he needs money. He's more he than ma- we do. He makes more. Well, we've made more. He's hours also more of talented than we are. We've made more hours Anything, of content. He has one made more quality of, of content. One minute of Neil Cicerenga content is worth more than all the Geek Nights ever times a thousand. Also, he's not getting that much more money than us on Patreon. He really deserves it. Oh, I should give him some money. I'm man. giving him money. Uh, the uh, here are the suggested charities, official charities of Geek Nights. Ready? Right. Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. Yeah, uh, I, I endorse that. EFF, except I don't agree with them on privacy, but everything else is fine. Whatever. Yep. Uh, the Creative Commons is yep. a good one. Yep. All right. The ACLU is good. ACLU is okay. Yeah, well, they're, okay. they're good because at least mm. they're pretty ideologically consistent. Yeah, Doctors Without Borders, always good. Yep. Totally yep. legit. Uh, you know what? Planned Parenthood, they could actually use the money right now. Oh, like, they, they just take donations straight up? I'm pretty sure you can donate directly to Planned Parenthood. Oh, I did not know that. I thought it was not a... If you I never thought of it as a charity. That would be like... Well, it shouldn't <laughs> be a charity. It sure, but I didn't realize that it was. Like, you could do that. It needs money. Sure, badly. why not? Uh, what are the other nerdy ones, though? Oh, archive.org. No. Uh, the, the Wikimedia Foundation. No. I'm trying to think of nerdy ones, you know. Uh, there's a few other Patreons of people we know you could give money to. They make art. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there might be one I'm missing or whatever because I didn't think of this until just now. But. Uh, Crash Course. If you're going to give money to any Patreon, give it to Crash Course. Yeah, Jesus. you don't need that. They are the some of the. That's some of the. That one, they're the reason a Patreon exists. Mm. And two, that's probably one of the more noble causes because they actually just create educational stuff for free forever. Mm. Independent of if you give them money. Mm. Kind of like Gig Nights. Uh, we'll keep doing Gig Nights even if you give no money to the Patreon ever. Mm. So, yeah. Oh, uh, Child's Play. Child's Play. There you go. Or, uh, you know, uh, Games Done Quick because they just turn that well, money... Well, that's, r- that's the... See, I'm not sure about the Games Done Quick, right? They turn that money right around into cancer charities. Well, they give it to the Prevent Cancer Foundation, which I'm not sure is about cancer prevention. Yeah. And it's like awareness, and those charities are usually Oh, it is like, awareness? It's not research? I mean, I don't know, but it's about preventing cancer. They might do research to prevent cancer. So... Uh, it's always tough with those cancer charities. Because we're going to talk about a dour topic, might as well get but started But Summer now. Games Done Quick does there was a, Without Borders. There was a big meta study. I didn't read the fullness of it yet, but it's 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 one of those like, oh, that sucks. They like, take all the studies and combine them? Yeah. yeah. The study basically said that the death rate, like N years out from cancer, has not decreased at all in 30-ish years, despite prevention, despite screening. And it basically said that screening for cancer and detecting it early has no outcome on the actual death rate across the population. Mm-hmm. That basically 
people who had like the few people who could be saved because they have the rare cancer that's actually that treatable and they catch it that early is mitigated by the people who get pre-screened and they aggressively treat a cancer that either would have been deadly anyway or wouldn't have been deadly but the treatment ended up being worse how often does treatment end up being worse you think that the oncologist editor should be able to well know. what it comes down to is a lot of cancers aren't actually treatable in any meaningful way Right, so you just tell the person this isn't treatable, deal with it. But the study's main point was that vastly increased cancer screening has had zero impact on cancer deaths. Mm. And then the, the rest of it, which I haven't finished reading, talks a lot about the ramifications of that and follow-up studies to determine you know, why the answer is currently still zero. Cancer well, sucks. What so. if you have the rare preventable one and you don't get screening because that eh, doesn't affect the statistics? And apparently, then... apparently, all these people getting colonoscopies earlier has not significantly impacted the death rate of colon cancer. Well, because if you get it, you're going to die, you know. Yeah, but th what they're saying is that pre-screening it has not reduced the death rate. Well, because it's not one of those rare preventable ones. Yeah, <laughs> or, but pre-screening theoretically you know, can magically. catch the polyps that would then, you know... I mean, I'm going to get my colonoscopies when I'm 40. So does that mean cleaning, you know, getting your polyp scraped out doesn't help you live longer? Uh, the, the, all the questions you're asking, I have not finished reading and it, it yet. Are you talking about just death rate? Because it could be like, okay, you're still going to die. Everyone, the death rate's 100%, right? Yeah. I got to live 10 years longer, and then I died. Well, That's no, a good move. I read, there's another article that talked about statistically the death rate's not 100% because so many people are alive today that... There's a, it's like a 99.998% chance that you'll actually die based on the evidence we have to date. Yeah, okay. Yeah, whatever. Anyway, uh, so to get onto a much, uh, the, one of the few things we could talk about that's worse than cancer, nuclear weapons. This is Rim's favorite topic for some reason. Just lately, because it's been in the news a lot. So what's been bothering me is You got a big Noam Chomsky Rim over here. Rim, yeah. Rim Chomsky. <laughs> Noam Chomsky is one of my favorite people. Okay. <laughs> so they're going to nuke us all. Basically, I know a lot about nukes, partly because I had some high school teachers who, like, when we like when we learned about World War II, I had a high school teacher, like the you know, like the sophomore year, like, well, kids, modern history coming. He we spent like a month talking about nuclear weapons. The dude just knew a lot about them and was real mad about them. And fun fact, he actually was a big Noam Chomsky fan. Okay. <laughs> and also a Lenin fan, so <laughs> your mileage may vary. <laughs> okay. And but, so recently. Uh, North Korea, you know, detonated a nuclear test, which is problematic for a lot of reasons. I mean, we're not, I don't want to talk about politics at all. But the headline that CNN ran was, North Korea detonates hydrogen bomb. Unlikely. Uh, definitely didn't happen. <laughs> and I realized already that most of the people I talked to on If they did, basis, I'm going to buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> yeah, uh, very few nations in history have ever developed or detonated a, quote, hydrogen bomb, which is a misnomer. Calling it a hydrogen bomb... It has nothing to do with hydrogen. <laughs> yeah, like, it's kind of like A-bomb, H-bomb, all that nonsense. Right, I mean, people... They don't really teach you this in school, right? They teach you about, like, Japan and dropping, you know, the little boy and the fat man, whatever, right? Yep. And, you know, you think atomic bomb. And then you know about ICBMs. It's like a big rocket that can go to the other side of the world. And, and But people don't realize that the warhead they put on the ICBM is not like the atomic bomb that was yeah. in Japan. It's a completely different thing. And in fact, people talk about India and Pakistan being nuclear states. They have... Uh, gun type wet. They have they the, have the things that we dropped on Japan. They have the thing that we dropped on Hiroshima at best. Right. Modified slightly to be a little more powerful. But no, we not... still have some of those because they're still useful. Like if you uh, want to. No, they're not. No, no. I no. thought that we use them in the tactical nukes, and you want to blow up like a navy. We don't. You no. The gun type bombs are not used by anyone anymore. Okay. At least as far as we can. I mean, as far as I can tell, they might be used by that kind of atomic artillery that even we decided it was a bad idea <laughs> because the, that Davy Crockett, uh, the human who launched it, couldn't be outside of its blast radius, and that was like a hundredth of a kiloton. No, I thought we had them in like like you know the bombers can just drop them. Uh, right, no, bombers the... don't use gun type weapons. Okay. Bombers don't use atomic bombs. They use thermonuclear weapons. I'm pretty sure that almost every weapon... We don't have any more atomic bombs left? Atomic bombs are... So, this is where I want to explain things, and then I'll let Scott ask questions Rim, about this. Rim's too nerdy about this. He just so, wants to nuke everybody. What happened with North Korea was not a thermonuclear device. When people say H-bomb, what they mean is a thermonuclear weapon. Which is not what the Manhattan Project invented? Nope. 
No. Specifically, they mean a two-stage thermonuclear weapon or a Teller Ulam device. So when was that invented? If not, if it 50s. was at the Manhattan Project, fifties. Like so, who did that? Us. The U.S. made pretty much all the progress in nuclear weapons. Okay, but I mean, who specifically? Uh, Teller and Ulam. Okay. <laughs> so how come no one knows about them? They're not famous like Oppenheimer They're famous or if you know about physics. Right, but they're not famous like, you know, Oppenheimer and Feynman Yeah, because or people don't know things about nukes. You could, mm-hmm. you could the, fir- the easiest way to know that someone doesn't know anything about nukes is if they even say hydrogen bomb or H-bomb. Because mm-hmm. those terms were invented by the press. Mm-hmm. But So what North Korea detonated was not a thermonuclear modern device. What it was is a variant of the weapon that we dropped on Nagasaki in World War II. Mm. So those weapons, the first nuclear weapons that were ever developed, were criticality weapons, meaning you've got some, like, uranium, right? And you get a lot of uranium. (laughs) Yep. If you get too much uranium too close to itself, like in too small a space, or plutonium, either way, then they're giving off enough radiation, enough neutrons and shit, to start a self-sustaining catastrophic reaction, like what's in a nuclear power plant. Uh, yeah. So those are also critical. They're critical. They're self-sustaining. They just keep going. Right. So one radiation, ba- you know, shoots out of one molecule and hits another one and makes that one go crazy. So like and uh, fission and so you've got some uranium two thirty five and it's just popping neutrons out. Some of those neutrons hit more uranium and they do some stuff and they're like radiation's coming out all over the place. This is baby's first like right. simple description. 10th but grade chemistry class. If you get a bunch of it together, it'll start reacting, which causes more reactions to happen. Exponential increasing reactions. Yeah. So you do that either by getting too much together or by surrounding it with something that's going to reflect radiation it's making back at itself. Mm-hmm. So there was a, th- a term for this in the old days of making nuclear weapons during the Manhattan Project. They called it tickling the dragon's tail <laughs> because while they had... Physics, you know, people with pieces of paper said, this is the amount. Someone had to test that shit. And you know how dangerous that was? They tested it from real far away. No, a lot of fucking people died. Oh. Yeah. So there's. if you want to read a really depressing Wikipedia article, read the article called The Demon Core. Because we had a a core of of nuclear material that we called the Demon Core because it killed a lot of people in experimentation. (laughs) Uh, one dude, Don't work there. One dude had just two halves of this thing apart, and he was holding them apart with a screwdriver, and he was just fucking with it. And he, I guess, sneezed and knocked their screwdriver out, and it closed and flashed. Mm. And he was dead. He mm. died of radiation poisoning days later. Like, he was done. So if you get radiation poisoning like that, don't wait days. It'll just be really bad and suffering. Uh, yeah, well, actually, it'll mm. be really bad, and then it'll be really good, and you'll feel great. For like another couple days. Oh. Yeah, you'll feel like... I didn't know. How does that work? (laughs) uh, I don't want to... So that's just (laughs) real depressing. But basically, it fucks your body up. Obviously. So you feel bad. But then your body starts shutting down. Uh. So your immune response and all the things that are making you actually feel bad... They turn off. They turn off. So you feel great. (laughs) And then you die. Mm. Well, you feel bad again and then you die. But we're not talking about... We're just talking about nuclear bombs. I want to keep this real constrained. (laughs) So... The early, like the first weapons we made were literally, you just have a ring of, of uranium and a, and a, like a rod of uranium and you would shoot the ring at the rod like a gun. They'd overlap and that would be too much critical mass so they would have a catastrophic reaction and explode. Mm. But uh, the reactions happened so fast, like on the order of nanoseconds, that the reaction would start when only a little bit of it was overlapping, so you'd only get a pretty minimal yield. You'd get the reaction going, but then the explosion of the reaction would break the material apart, and the reaction would stop, and most of that uranium just was <laughs> dust and plasma and shit out in the so atmosphere. So you need some way to like hold the explosion in until it's even crazier, and then let it go when you want. Yep. So we made those kinds of bombs. If you're evil. And we dropped it on Hiroshima, we, the s- design is so simple that we didn't even test it. Like, we just, we just dropped it. We just assumed it would work. Mm. How did, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't explode when it hits something. So it what, explodes when the gun goes off in the bomb. So how does, is there like a timer or something? Or? Uh, I actually don't know. I don't know the details. Is of there a like remote the control? I actually do not know much about the like because like in, you know you watch Looney weapons. Tunes and they're always like hitting bombs with hammers oh, and stuff. Oh, so and it doesn't work like that. Our thermo- thermonuclear devices, like the ones that are actually crazy dangerous, mm-hmm. a lot of them would have gone off if we dropped them, like for real. 
Mm-hmm. Like, well, we our weapons They work were, by get. If I hit one with a hammer, it would go off? No, they were just fucking, like, poorly designed and not safe. Oh, great. We designed the weapons first, and the safety came way later. Do you know how we made the first two bombs that we actually dropped safe? The nuclear payload was just separate, like in a box. The plane took off, and then a dude in the plane crawled down there and activated it. Mm-hmm. That was, so if they dropped it, it might have just gone off. It was some crazy crap. In fact, the, the uh, gun bombs were so reliable that those are the weapons that most countries developed that were, aren't in the current nuclear powers. So like South Africa, with their nuclear weapons, they had a bunch of bombs like that. Uh, I'm pretty sure Israel has bombs, and a lot of their bombs are also like that at the time. So the implosion bombs that we dropped in Nagasaki were much more advanced, and so like the engineering challenge is night and day. Instead, you have a ring of high explosives, tons and tons of high explosives, and then they're shaped, and there's lensing. Like so regular have, explosives, like TNT? Yes, just like TNT, stuff like that. I think it was actually like the sort of primer cord, like RDX C4? type stuff. C4? Nah, it was more like RDX, I think. Uh, again, I'm not it too sure. It was conventional bombs. Yes, conventional bombs, tons of that shit. But you'd array it with like fast and slow propellants in different shapes, so you have this lens, so the explosion would happen with such precision that the core, which was just a hollow sphere of like plutonium, would be crushed instantaneously from all directions at once, and that would cause the reaction. And it was significantly more powerful. Mm. What North Korea just did is one of two possible things, because the yield was too low. Real thermonuclear devices have kind of a minimum yield, like, so high that there's no way what they did was actually a thermonuclear device. So either they did something called boosted fission, where you have a regular old Hiroshima-style bomb, but in that empty core, you fill it with something like lithium. And basically, it'll compress in and do the normal atomic bomb thing, but that middle part will fuse from the pressure. That fusion reaction will make a ton of neutrons that then just do crazy more fission. Mm-hmm. So it's still mostly so a fission li- bomb. So the lithiums fu- are in the middle of the explosion. They yes. fuse together and so make who knows what. fission, fusion, fission, like boom all at once. And the yield of that could be like 10 to 100 times more. Like you could make a bomb like that and get up to almost a megaton if you really tried. Oh, uh, that's just, that's really, uh... Yeah, so a megaton? <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah, so to give just you... Just what we want. So to give you a reference, because I, I tweeted about this a while ago, uh, the weapons that the United States used in World War II were 10 to 20 kilotons, meaning 10,000 tons of TNT equivalent explosion. Uh, the biggest nuclear weapons ever designed were on the order of 50 to 100 megatons. A hundred million tons of TNT. A fusion boosted bomb could be ten to a hundred times more than the weapons that were the weapons that were actually used in the real world. So that is the best case for North Korea of what they developed. They figured out how to make the the output of their regular crappy old school atomic bombs be significantly. Where are they even bigger. getting any radioactive stuff from? Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, uh, is it, is it, can they mine it in North Korea? Uh, that I actually don't and how, know. Can they refine it in North Korea? Apparently they did, or someone gave it to them. So we'll see. I mean, it's kind of a secretive state. China sort of just tells everyone to stay away. Right. I mean, it's like, that's, it's hard to get. <laughs> in fact, uh, one of the reasons that the U.S. had so many atomic weapons after World War II is that. We had uranium in our country. We could, just Ru- dig, we could just dig it up. And Russia, for a long time, had no known source of uranium they found, in they, Russia. They found some. They found some later. There's a lot of Russia to find it in. <laughs> yeah, but early on, they didn't have it. Sure. So and the difference, So the other thing that North Korea could have done is develop- I mean, that's civilization, right? It's like, I got horses. You don't. <laughs> so the other you thing North trade Korea could have done. Because one thing that they might have done, it might have been a boosted fission weapon. Which was what the U.S. made. We made a huge stockpile of those things in the Cold War, ready to just lob with conventional bombers. The other thing they might have done is they might have made a Sloika-style device. Sloika is like a, it's a pastry cake in Russia. It's like a layer cake. And a Sloika device is layers and layers of like that fission, fusion, fission, fusion, fission, fusion. So it's more like an advanced version of a boosted fission weapon. And those things 
are a dead end, we learned from physics later. Like, that theory peters out at about a megaton and isn't really viable as a weapon. Like, they're okay, but yeah, there's a Yeah, a limit. megaton bomb isn't viable as a weapon. If I drop that on you, you'll be fine. No, well, it's a megaton, but it's also kind of big and unwieldy, and there's problems with that sort of design. I'll put it in my giant plane and drop it on you. What are you going to do about it? So, North Korea has either one of those two things. The ramifications, however are not what a lot of people are like, oh, now they can make real nuclear weapons. Not really. The ramifications are still bad, though. Don't get me wrong. If they <laughs> made a boosted fission weapon, the former type, that doesn't mean they're going to be making like more powerful weapons. That means they can take their existing style weapons and put them on missiles, which they couldn't their enemy, do before. Their enemy is not far away. That's the real... Yeah. See, if their enemy was us... We don't really have much to worry about, no matter what they have. Yeah, because the furthest No matter how much range, atomic technology they have, they don't have something that can fly halfway around the world and land in New York, right? The best weapon they have, the best missile at least, could theoretically hit the West Coast at its extreme range. Right, and accurately? No, it would Maybe. probably land in like the forest or on some hippie's house. Dude, you want to talk about accurately? The <laughs> there's a there's a term called the CEP fifty, <clears throat> circular uh, error probable, which is the percentage basically. It's it's the radius <clears throat> if you launch a nuke where there is a 50 50 shot it'll land within that radius mm -hmm. think about that so some ceps were in the miles so here's a circle of like five miles in diameter All right. there's a 50 50 there's a 50 percent chance it'll land somewhere in that area so from here to work is about five miles so 50 50 it'll land between here and work or uh, somewhere else uh yeah so <laughs> somewhere else bomb the wrong place vermont <laughs> that's part of the horror of nuclear weapons the the things that we had after world war ii were not only terrifying in their power but they were inaccurate as shit Right, uh, so now we just send them into space and they land in exactly the right spot. So North Korea might have developed boosted fission weapons, meaning they could take nuclear weapons that they can already make today and deliver them somewhere nearby like Japan or South Korea. That's not anything to sneeze at. The other thing they could have done is developed a Sloika-style device, meaning they could make a megaton weapon but probably couldn't deliver it anywhere. Neither one of these, while they have socio-political ramifications, is a modern nuclear weapon. The engineering challenge... And by modern, you mean how old? <laughs> yeah, so... The 50s? Yeah, 50s, right. 60s. <laughs> right, okay, so there has... Developments since then are probably A, non-existent, or B, secret. Or so both. the Teller Ulam design is secret. Like, you can go look up, Scott, you and I together. Anyone who knows even basic physics and engineering could make... A gun-type uranium nuclear weapon, if they had the if materials. If we had uranium, which we don't. If you had the materials, the engineering challenge and is not you difficult. can't get it at the chemistry lab because they don't have enough. The implosion-type weapons, the engineering challenge is a, like an order of magnitude more. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to make that lensing, and they're huge. Mm -hmm. The fission-boosted weapons, or the fusion-boosted fission weapons, boosted fission, uh, sloika, all those things, the engineering challenge is substantial, but... I cannot express to you the gulf in engineering challenge between even the most advanced Sloika weapon that could ever be conceived and a modern thermonuclear device. The fact that only five countries in the world, arguably four, have ever developed that technology. And some of them were just gifted. They didn't figure it out on their own, yeah. right? I mean, the Soviets were kind of on the right track, but there was a lot of espionage going on. Uh, we shared a lot of secrets with Britain. France, there was a lot of sharing going on and apparently a lot of espionage. This stuff is not easy to develop. Like, people talk about what, India and Pakistan. Nope. They don't have those weapons. They do not have thermonuclear weapons. Right. Think about calculus, right? There's always some story about someone who lives in the sticks somewhere, who never took math class, who figures out calculus on their own and has just different terms for everything and different symbols or who knows what. But it is calculus. They figured it out independently. Pretty much only once in the history of the entire world, despite half a century of trying plus, only one peoples ever were able to figure out, as, as far as we know how to make this thing, maybe two. And it took a huge percentage of the GDP of the most powerful and economically viable country in the world decades 
to design that. It also required constant testing by blowing up nukes. Mm -hmm. So because we have the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and because no one's allowed to test nukes... And if you, you even if you wanted to test nukes and you didn't care about the treaty, everyone else will know immediately. Yes, I mean, the whole uh, world knew... Unless you just keep failing. The world knew within minutes... In which minutes case, keep going. ...that North Korea tried this bullshit, and we knew within hours that... Either they develop boosted weapons. You can't do weapons. it secret. Even if you did it at the core of the Earth or in space, everyone can see or find you with their Richter scale. Yep. <laughs> Seismograph, whatever. It is such a secret that actually no one knows for real how to make them. Like, we know the theory. You can look up, you'll see these diagrams. Like, everyone sees the diagrams of what a modern nuke looks like. Uh, but the actual engineering. Of Even how if to I had a thing. whole pile of plutonium in the closet and I was totally radiation proof like Superman or something, I still couldn't do it. Right? I couldn't get it to blow up that way because it's that hard to figure out how to make that happen. And that is a good thing because the true horror of thermonuclear weapons... And I can't do trial and error because everyone will see me trying. ...is that their yield is literally unlimited. There is nothing limiting the power of a nuclear weapon. You can make one that just blows up the solar system, like, boop. Yeah, or modern the, nuclear the weapons, sun. where there's a term, dial a yield or variable yield, where you just pick what yield you want from the weapon. And it has an upper limit because it... Does it have a lower limit? Can I be like, yeah, just be like one ton? So that's where things get kind of complicated. So uh, this is where I want to ask you questions. Scott, have you ever heard of a neutron bomb? Yeah, I mean... What, what do you think a neutron bomb is? So I don't, I'm pretty sure that this is complete bullshit because it's just sort of that, yeah. you know... Those, and I don't fault it's, you. It's one of those stories that people tell that's complete bullshit, like, hey, there's a secret in you know, Mario, you can go yep. to this, right? It's Jump what, up and down 65,535 times. Right, exactly. So the story the kids tell about the neutron bomb in school, right? Because like, I'm not uh, as morbid as Rim where I actually want to research such horrible things other than make them no longer exist. Uh, the story kids tell about the neutron bomb is that it goes off and shit doesn't blow up. Like all the buildings in the, in everywhere will just be perfectly intact. It doesn't blow up everything, but it shoots neutrons everywhere really fast and it kills everybody. And, but it doesn't destroy anything. So they're not actually a special bomb. All it's it like, is sort of like cosmic rays hitting your computer, right? It does, you don't see them hitting your computer, but they still flip a bit. You know, the neutrons would come and like destroy your body because your body is and kill your cells. So, but it wouldn't kill a building because just concrete. So actually, the effective radius of the neutrons is about the same as the explosion radius. So the, uh, the only reason neutron bombs existed was to take out tanks. Mm -hmm. Because if you blow them up, it'll kill all the unprotected people because of the explosion, but the people in the tanks would be fine. The neutrons make the tanks so radioactive that the tanks then kill everyone inside the tanks immediately mm -hmm. from, the, from the nuclear radiation. But it's true that it doesn't blow everything up? Uh, no, it blows everything up within its radius. It's just the radius isn't that big. Uh. But it's not a special bomb. Neutron bombs are just thermonuclear weapons with the yield dialed all the way down. Uh-huh. So actually dialing the yield down makes them more horrifying in a different way? So you couldn't dial the yield down, say, to make really efficient, say, useful in modern-day construction bombs. Like, I want to make a big tunnel under the river to put a train through. So Let me use this in a practical and non-evil mechanism by turning the yield down so it just makes a tunnel. So you have, to have the you have to have the yield pretty high up, but with a thermonuclear device, there's a sweet spot where... So you have the nuclear weapon that goes off and has its yield of like a megaton or 10 megatons or whatever. But like Sarbamba is an example because that's the most horrific thing humans ever made. That was a fifth, that was a 100 megaton weapon. The Soviets detonated it <clears throat> at half power. They dialed the yield to 50%. Mm -hmm. And the, the results of that test were catastrophic. But the difference between the 50 and the 100 megaton version is that the 50 megaton version, you have a nuclear device, and it's wrapped in an inert material like lead. Mm -hmm. So a lot Which doesn't of, let radiation get out. Well, no, it's more that, it, that's just to hold it together. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the actual explosion is fusion, which means that the energy yield is primarily from that, and not that much fallout is generated. Well, that's good. At least better than, you know, I mean, you still... It's still horrible, so but it's better than, you know. So if you were doing peaceful nuclear weapons, like excavation or whatever, theoretically you'd use that kind of weapon because the actual fallout is relatively low, like reasonably acceptable for some use cases. However, to make an efficient weapon, if you replace that lead with, say, uranium, then the 50 megatons goes off, and that causes all that uranium to do fission, and you double your yield. 
mm-hmm. with a minimal increase in weight. And the radiation Isn't fallout... is uranium really heavy, though? Like, his lead is heavy, yeah. but uranium is even heavier. The fallout from, from that kind of weapon is horrific. Well, I mean, it's all horrific. Yeah. But it's even well, more, look, even it's more horrific, horrific on, than yeah, regular horrific It's horrific level. on the scale of nuclear weapons. <laughs> but I guess my only last question for you, Scott, is... How do you think a, a thermonuclear device works? Because no you've seen diagrams. Nobody knows. Yeah, no one knows. There's some, isn't there like some mysterious code name like fog bank nonsense fog bank or is something? Fog probably an aerogel of some kind that's used to hold everything together. An that aerogel? Gets converted into pla- you know about aerogels. Yeah, but what, an aerogel is going to hold in that? Uh, no, so the, aer- so the best mm-hmm. theory we've got, and this is why it's such a challenge. This is the best we know. Basically, a, f- a boosted fission bomb goes off first. Mm-hmm. But that's just a little baby bomb. Uh, it's not the explosion or anything else that causes the fusion reaction. That bomb generates X-rays. So many X-rays. The X-rays are channeled via basically a big lens and a containment system into the second stage of the weapon. You can have any number of stages. They're just fusion all the way down. The X-rays themselves are so much that they compress the secondary. Mm-hmm. So light. Photons are compressing the secondary. So the dialing is adjusting the how much X-rays. Maybe it's not. It's that's where we don't know a lot about. Right, because that's that's the trick. Is that you know it's not just something that you set off, right? There's a way we know that there's a way to dial it. So there's something that you can adjust how much at some point. So think of it this way. What do you think the engineering challenge is of all the timing necessary to have a burst of x-rays such that they physically compress something to the point that it fuses? Right, because you can make a bunch of x-rays, but you don't make them all at once. They don't get to the destination all at once. It ain't going to happen. And it's not a physics problem. A lot of people can come up with a lot of ideas as to how that would work. But yeah, I mean, you could think you mean like you could just make a sun, right? It's like we know how the sun works. We know the chemistry of how the sun works. It's like, well, get us, you know, I can write down on paper. Well, it's helium fuses together and then it makes, you know, you get enough of it and you're good. But how do you actually make that happen in a space? You have I give you tanks of helium as much as you want. You have your own space lab. It's in outer space. You can have any elements from the periodic table that you want in any quantity and you won't die. And you can have any machine you want. How are you going to make a star? You you get to make a nebula first, right? It takes too long. (laughs) It's not going to work. The engineering engineering to make a thermonuclear device from what North Korea did a few days ago would be like uh, your your warrior in Civ V trying to make the spaceships at the end of the game. It would be like, you know, if at home, you just started making I-7s in your closet. Yeah. It's like, you can't do... <laughs> Actually, it'd be easier to make an I-7. Get- it would be easier for a country like North Korea to make a chip as fast as the I-7 than it would be for them to engineer no, but a it would, but I'm saying device. you in your closet making an I-7. It's like, you, yeah. <laughs> you couldn't... You know, even if I gave you the plans for it, it's like, and I gave you silicon, you, you couldn't... You couldn't print on that silicon. What are you gonna do? Get a laser and start drawing <laughs> on it in your not clean room? It's like so. I you guess got nothing. To end this on a kind of a, a positive note, two atomic weapons were used in human history, and we're not gonna debate about by, the... by luck uh, and many near misses. We have yeah. thankfully not used any since. But yeah, well, not except, that we've except not for used testing. Any since, that for for on people, the power of those weapons pales so powerfully small before the power of actual thermonuclear devices and the fact that and people don't really realize that that's you know they just think atomic bomb and they think of japan and that's all they think about they don't realize that this much more horrific bomb has been made and is the only thing that we have and the fact that in the so many generations of humans decades and decades and decades and decades i mean from the 50s until 2016 we have no human has ever used one of these weapons. Says a, I hope it says a lot about us. Well, used them on people. Uh, well, yeah, well, we used them on people by accident. We used a few them times. on trees and rocks a lot and water. Because the U.S. military after World War II basically treated those weapons just like a natural extension of bomber technology. It wasn't until Castle Bravo when they developed an eight megaton weapon that was accidentally fifteen megatons. That was when the generals started saying, whoa, uh, maybe we go too far. (laughs) You and play gods? (laughs) Yeah. Like, that was when they started treating them like something fundamentally unique. And 
It's also a testament that humans have never been able to develop these again, and that somehow, despite the fact that Russia, the U.S., China, France, yeah, if Britain... Play, if playing gods was easy, we wouldn't be here. Five countries in the world have developed this technology. Two of them hate each other and most of the rest of us, at least in terms of geopolitics, at different stages through history, and yet no one's ever shared the secret, no one else has ever figured out the secret, and no one's ever used one. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. The patrons, in order of the amount of money they give us, are... Nicholas Brandau, Rebecca Dunn, Amanda Duchette, James David White, Christian Kuntz, Jess, Mechanical Mind, William Eisenrose. The donation is coming from inside the house. Clinton Walton, MyStady.com, Phil Ulrich, Renee from New Zealand. Robert Lee, Ryan Perrin, Drew Openlander, Rare LaValle, Brian Cedroni, Rochelle Mantanona, Finn Eric Solverald, Rim Eats Poop. Kinetic Man, Aaron Cerise, Chris Midkiff, Chris Knox, Flame Darkfire, Samuel Cordery, Daniel Redman, Chris Haddad, Doug Schneider, Sean Klein, Chris Reimer, and Thomas Hahn. We finished shooting of episodes 14 and 15 of Geek Nights Presents Utena on Sunday. So I'm actually in the middle of editing now, and I'm going to try to get at least one of those fully together with the new process and everything before I go away for a long ski trip at the beginning of February. So. I'll keep this one short because we just also recorded the uh, December Q&A, which will be out this week. Uh, there was a little bit of trouble, and I lost Scott's audio for the first half of it, but I had the backup running, but the backup was not calibrated great because I rarely have to go to the backup, and I realized that our process has post-hoc, post-record compression, so I don't have compression in line on the pre-record like I did with the old rig. So as a result, Scott's voice clips a bit, but that gets cleared up about halfway through because I only lost the first half of Scott's audio. So it's all in there. Uh, all patrons will get the Geek Nights December 2015 Q&A uh, very soon, and I will now open up the question submission for Geek Nights 2016 Patreon Q&A. And now I leave you with something really, 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 really years weird. ago, a nine-tailed fox suddenly appeared. If you believe it. Naruto, Naruto, believe it, believe it. Yeah, I am of my ninja clan, ninja clan, here we stand. Naruto, I'm on my way. Naruto, I'll be okay. Getting ready to fight on sight. Got my best friends by my side. Sasuke, he's really cool. Sakura, the beautiful. Kowaka. Cool,